Hi everyone, before we get started, I wanted to let you know that you can follow me on my new Twitter account because I got suspended on my old one. This is the second time that this has happened to me within the span of a year. Basically, I made a joke that the Twitter gods didn't like and I got kicked off the platform once again. It is my own fault for falling for some conservative rage bait. Thank you, Elon Musk. Uh, the free speech really won today. The platform is definitely safer without my old account on it. So uh, that being said, follow me on this new account. You can also follow me on Threads and Blue Sky. I hope one of them overtakes Twitter one day. What an awful, rotten, garbage, terrible health site. Also, if anyone has any contacts at Twitter and could help me get my old account back for something that was clearly a joke, uh, I'm gonna just throw that out there because I'm really pissed that I lost all my followers. Thanks. <laughs> So if you've been on TikTok at all recently, you'll know that the two rotating villains of the week are Jojo Siwa and Jennifer Lopez. And since we've already discussed Jojo in a previous video, I figured I'd take a stab at addressing the elephant in the bodega. What was your go-to order at the bodega? My go-to order at the bodega was ham and cheese on a roll with an orange drink, if you know, you know, and a small bag of chips. Now, we'll get into why exactly these specific clips are going viral a little later, but all of this was prompted by a new Jennifer Lopez project that came out earlier this month. It's sort of a two-parter. There's This Is Me Now, which is sort of a visual album, but also a movie musical type deal, and an accompanying documentary called The Greatest Love Story Never Told. Both are available to watch on Amazon Prime. So first, let's start by going over what this is about and why it exists. This Is Me Now is sort of a spiritual sequel to the 2002 pop album This Is Me Then. According to JLo herself, this album is meant to chronicle the last 20 years in between both albums, specifically in regards to her love life. You know, over a decade ago, she was notoriously with Ben Affleck, and then she had three other marriages, a bunch of other public failed relationships, and now she's back together with Ben Affleck. Obviously, that story is told very literally within the lyrics of this album, but she chose to pair it with visuals for this movie musical thing that she's got going on, and I'm just going to give you the summary before we get into how it all works. The film starts off with an intro of the Puerto Rican legend Alida and Taru, which is the story of two star-crossed lovers that are ultimately represented by a flower and a hummingbird. Then we hear JLo monologuing a bit over a shot of her on the back of a motorcycle with a man about this story and what it means to her, and then the motorcycle crashes. And then we cut to a scene of JLo working in a factory, uh, and the factory workers are all feeding rose petals into a giant CGI mechanical heart. And then the heart stops working, and there's a dance sequence, and then they suit up JLo in a hazmat suit, and she goes into the heart to try to fix it, I guess. And then she dies, and she wakes up and is talking to Fat Joe, who is a therapist character in this. Like, he's literally credited as therapist. They talk a little bit about the weird dream she's having, and then a little bit about JLo's belief in astrology. And then we cut to this big glass room with a bunch of apartments in it, where this sort of Alex Jones figure, who I later learned was played by Ben Affleck, and he's just in some really uncanny valley makeup, starts talking about how there's no love in the world, and then JLo and this dude who's referred to as a Libra get into an argument because he gets mad that she points out that Libras are meticulous. Like, that's literally what happens. And then they have, like, a really abusive fight, and then they do the next song, and it's like a dance sequence where they're tied to each other. Then she escapes, and a bunch of Zodiac signs represented by different celebrity cameos debate about why Jennifer Lopez cannot stay in a marriage. The dialogue in this is all very cringe, we'll come back to this later. Meanwhile, JLo then ends up in another marriage. There's this whole wedding scene, another dance sequence. There's sort of this running joke where, you know, it's like three men are playing the same husband. Then we cut to a scene where JLo's friends, like a group of her friends, are in her house and she comes in with this guy who's supposed to look like Bad Bunny, but he isn't Bad Bunny. And the friends try to stage an intervention where they call her a sex addict and question why she can't ever just be left alone and why she always has to be in a relationship. And then she insults them and she's really mean to all of them. Then she attends like a group therapy session called Love Addicts Anonymous and she does this sort of ballad song there. It's the worst song on the whole album. Then as she's going back to regular therapy with Fat Joe, she gets an invitation from one of the friends in her friend group to his wedding. Then she returns to Fat Joe's therapy office and tells him about a dream she keeps having about her childhood neighborhood in, you guessed it, the Bronx. She then sees a younger version of herself who's all like dirty and beat up and sad and is like, you abandoned me, you loved everyone else but me. And then Big JLo and Kid JLo reconcile and then that causes the heart to be fully restored. And then after this, she goes to her friend's wedding alone, you know, symbolizing that she can be alone without another person. And then eventually some hummingbirds show up and they lead her to her true love. And that's the end. 
So let's start with some positives. Uh, JLo can dance. She can still dance. I mean, I don't know a whole lot about dance in the spectrum of technicality. Uh, I just appreciate it as an art form. I can't dance for shit. So this whole movie project is very choreography heavy and she does a good job at it. So at the very least I can say that, I guess. It goes without saying though that the rest of this is tonally incoherent, you know, story-wise, concept-wise, tone-wise. You can't really tell if she wants it to be funny or serious. And I think obviously the most important thing in a visual album is the aesthetics, right? And I think there were some good aesthetic and visual concept ideas here, but they were not executed well. It seemed like they kind of scrimped on some things for budget purposes, which will inform you more when you watch the actual documentary about how this got made. Everything just has sort of this CGI, steampunky, glossy sheen over it. None of it seems real. All of it seems a little too up in fantasy land for you to like grab onto any of it. Okay, so the thing that I guess informed my experience and how I approached this documentary versus the actual music video movie that JLo ended up producing out of this is that I watched the documentary first. Uh, not only because I feel like it has the most meme potential, but I feel like because everyone was saying that the actual like movie musical product was so incoherent that maybe watching the documentary first would help me, you know, get a little bit of a deeper dive into her psyche and it certainly did that. I guess what strikes me uh, so strongly about like watching the documentary first is the fact that JLo takes herself so seriously. You can tell that this is going to be her version of a magnum opus. It's gonna be her lemonade, you know? She wants this to be the trademark stamp and story of her life. She goes on these diatribes about art and what it means to be an artist and being real and genuine. And then the whole movie itself is so unserious. At one point, all of the guest cameo celebrities that she has in it go on some random tangent making Vanderpump Rules jokes, like while they're having this serious meeting, you know, of the signs or whatever. And to me, it's just like, pick a tone. You know what I mean? Do you want it to be your, you know, iconic stamped visual album that says a lot about you as an artist? Or do you want it to be sort of this goofy, self-aware, tongue-in-cheek thing? Because this, you know, project has elements of both and neither of them really work that well. And again, the documentary sort of informs more of the perspective behind the actual, you know, visual album that she made, so I'll get into that. Basically what you need to know about both of these, the movie and the documentary, is that it's entirely self-funded on JLo's part. In fact, in the documentary, they go into the fact that they tried to sell this movie to different streamers and distributors, and none of them wanted it because visual albums don't ever really sell well or have high viewer numbers. And so JLo's like, I don't care, this is a passion project of mine, everyone's up against me, all of Hollywood is up against me, I'm gonna fund this with my own money. Which I guess would be admirable if not for the fact that this is JLo's net worth, you know? Is there really any conflict or tension if you're putting up some of your own vanity money for a vanity project? No, not really, but the documentary, which obviously questions JLo uncritically because it's produced by JLo and her marketing team, tries to employ these classic behind the scenes production documentary tactics. Like, you know, they're all sitting down trying to figure out how to get the budget to make this happen. JLo has these production challenges because the mud that they use is not muddy enough. They show her trying to convince all of these celebrities to make cameos in her movie and a lot of them, you know, just appear to be not understanding it or they're not available. There's this really cringy scene where she's like naming off all these celebrities like, oh, like I want Ariana Grande to be in it. And they're like, Ariana Grande's in London, she's booked. And I mean, as far as the celebrity cameos go, she does get a couple big names, you know, Jane Fonda, Post Malone, who like very clearly doesn't know where he is the whole time he's filming this. Kiki Palmer, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is like so cringe and out of place in this whole thing. The funniest cameo is Jennifer Lewis because the whole time in the, in the behind the scenes production of the documentary, she's like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. I don't know what the fuck is going on. I'm Jennifer Lewis though, and I'm having a good time. And you're like, you know what? At least someone here is having a good time because JLo spends the whole rest of the documentary when she's not rehearsing or yapping about mud consistency, just fucking crying. Like, just crying a lot. You can tell that it's it's really fucking her up. Like, I, I think she mentioned in the doc that she has been to therapy, and I hope that's the case because, you know, happy for her. She found her happy ending with fucking Bruce Wayne, of all people, once again. 
Uh, but you know, you can tell she's really hurting, but it doesn't make me feel actually bad for her. It just makes me feel like I'm watching something that I'm not supposed to watch. And Ben Affleck doesn't help things because every time they put the camera on him, especially in the beginning, there's an extended sequence where he sort of talks through his feelings about this whole project and he's like, I think certain things should remain private. And I think that if this is hurting you to put this out there in this way, then you should not talk about it and it should just be private. Like he clearly does not want this to get made. The thing about JLo is she has always struck me as someone who has just been famous and is famous for being famous. Obviously she's an actress, she's a singer, she's a dancer, you know, she does all three, but can you think of someone who's really a diehard Jennifer Lopez fan? You know what I mean? Does JLo have a fan base with a stan name? Do you ever hear about the wrath of the JLo stans on Twitter? Like, I just don't think she has that strong of a fan base to warrant how seriously she takes herself, and I think it's part of the reason why this whole visual project, as grand as it is in scope, did not land very well with people. But you know, throughout her career, since her first Jenny from the Block era and album, really, she sort of had this self-ascribed brand, you know, a brand that she literally gave to herself. Uh, celebrities and musicians especially all have brands, right? But a part of that sort of marketability comes from what fans glom onto and what they attach to and the way that they find you relatable. JLo's whole brand has always been that she was just this little girl from the Bronx who, you know, grew up and, you know, found herself in Hollywood in stardom because of this undeniable talent. And that's what Jenny from the Block means, right? The Block referring to the block that she grew up in in the Bronx, New York. However, and I'll play some examples of this so you can understand what I mean here, the Block uh, does not accept J-Lo anymore. J-Lo has not been to the block in 40 years. Uh, from my understanding, she left there when she was rather young, you know, after, after she got discovered, and there have been many instances of her returning to the block to sell things and, you know, perpetuate her marketability in the Bronx because she's this rags-to-riches success story, and the block does not claim her because they can very easily tell that she only references her upbringing in the Bronx when she wants to appear more relatable, when in reality she doesn't really do anything for the community there, she just references them all the time while living her luxurious life with Ben Affleck in Los Angeles. I am not from the Bronx, uh, my dad is from Queens, and he actually worked in the Bronx, his job was in the Bronx, and he worked there every day for 37 years. Uh, I feel like he has more claim to the block than J-Lo ever did. In particular, there's this one clip going around that's actually from the documentary of J-Lo sort of reminiscing on her time in the Bronx, and it is getting cooked alive by every New Yorker on the internet, so I'm just gonna play that now. Taking my hair out like this. It reminds me like when I was 16 in the Bronx, running up and down the block. A crazy little girl who used to f be wild and no limits, all dreams and this is like so cringy and embarrassing, especially if you know anything about the JLo lore and how inauthentic the Bronx as a concept is to her actual brand, despite how she may insist otherwise. This clip blew up on TikTok and other social media, which then prompted other social media users who have happened to have interactions with JLo over the years to share their experiences, and they are not great. Tell me about a time when a celebrity was rude to you. Jennifer Lopez. And literally all the other shoppers had to stop what they were doing because she needed to come in and buy something. What was so important that everything had to be shut down? Ms. Lopez needed a pack of juicy fruit. She says she doesn't let, doesn't like people to look at her in the eyes. And I know. I had a friend who worked audio on the JLo project and she had him kicked out, stopped the whole production and everything because he looked her in the eyes. I have like 15 more stories like this. Now, I have seen some JLo defenders come out of the woodwork in the last, I don't know, couple of days. Because at the end of the day, you know, she is a successful woman. It is much more difficult to be a successful woman because everything you do is interpreted as diva-ish behavior, even if it's, you know, a reasonable request. However, with the amount of people coming out and saying that they've had bad experiences with Jennifer Lopez, 
I don't really know if that's the case. I feel like JLo really came into her own in the time of like, you know, early 2000s, 2010s tabloid culture. And with the rise of social media, that culture has really evolved to the point where being this sort of untouchable, narcissistic, full of yourself figure does not really do anything for the majority of people. You have to appear authentic in some way. And JLo, after this whole project, seems more out of touch than ever. Am I like manifesting her downfall or anything? Not particularly, although it seems like that's kind of the case based on how well the This Is Me Now tour is actually selling. But as a native New Yorker, am I gonna continue to laugh at the bodega clips? Yes, yes I am. Hey, Brian. Yeah. If you were going to the bodega for lunch, uh, what would your order be? For lunch? Yeah. Um, I'm pretty basic, but probably like, you know, I usually go for like, like the American kind of sub. Like it's like, you know, ham, turkey, cheese, lettuce, tomato. Maybe an avocado in there, mayo. What's your bev? Uh, usually a Arizona iced tea. Would you ever go to the bodega and say that you want an orange drink? Like if I said orange drink, do you know what that is? No. That, right, because it could mean anything, right? There's several orange drinks. Is that or, orange soda, orange cream soda, like orange juice? Uh, yeah, I don't know. JLo's a fraud!